Where are my notes? Who took my notes? This stinks! This is total BS! Th oh, here they are. Dear God, it wasn't a dream. Space Quest, the second episode of Frasier, second episode of the first season. We last uh, left off last week with Martin, Frasier, Eddie, and Daphne all watching a movie, and Frasier's just sitting in the middle, just kind of vexed that this has happened to him. This wasn't the vision he had for his life, but it's the best thing for him, as we'll find out over the next 11 years. So this is his new family, and he's trying to come to terms with it. So he wakes up in the morning, he comes out, and there's Daphne rambling on about the cooking and the cleaning that she's done. She lets us know that Martin has been a cop for 30 years. Uh, she's been looking for tripe. And Frazier just looks at her and says, And you are. <laughs> she says, Oh, Daphne Moon, you hired me. Oh, then it wasn't a dream. And we're told, uh, of course, I want you to keep in mind that we need to keep our morning ablutions on a need-to-know basis. It's very important. So there's a tense breakfast, and Frazier explains to his father, Mary Poppins, and the hound from hell, that the magic, that is me, is ruined if his morning routine is disrupted in any way. And in this scene, Frazier comes across as very prissy and very unreasonable. He can't open his paper. It has to have the rubber band on it. He's got to have the coffee the way he likes it. We'll get to that coffee in a minute. He likes to have his um, oatmeal or whatever he has, and Frazier's made him eggs in a nest. So you can see, um, excuse me, Martin's made him eggs in a nest, which is the old Crane family secret recipe. And you can see here that Martin's really trying. He's accepting his circumstances. He's even going as far as to cook Frasier breakfast when he could just sit there and demand that he be served. He's really putting in an effort. And as we see at the end of this show, it's, it's Martin that's the first one willing to put in the effort. So the breakfast is very, very tense, and Frasier's being far too fussy. And he says that, like ripples in a still pond, his bad mood could destroy all of Seattle, basically. And it, it reminds me of a scene much later in the show where he is penalized for putting up an unauthorized door knocker by the condo board. And he explains that if someone sees the knocker, perhaps they smile and they pick up a piece of trash and someone will help someone across the street. And the condo board president, who's a good character, says that he has to take down the knocker despite the ramifications to world peace. And there's another moment like that here where Frazier, if he doesn't have his breakfast and his newspaper just the right way, the all of Seattle will suffer because they won't benefit from his brilliance. It's all a bit much. So Martin has seemed to have accepted the situation. He's actually softened a bit uh, from last week when he was overly gruff. He's still woefully oblivious to Frazier's need. Um, and, and just as a note, Eddie is absolutely still staring. So we cut to KACL, and Frazier's topic for the show is intrusion. And we have a wonderful call-in by Christopher Reeve, Superman himself. And he calls in as Leonard, uh, someone who doesn't get the point of intrusion at all. He's off on a different topic. And, and Frazier says, and your call is related to intrusion. How exactly? Um, he has agoraphobia. And Frazier at the end says that someone will give him the name of a qualified therapist. And it makes me think, why doesn't Frazier do private practice? We later find out that his show runs from 2 to 5. He's always arriving at the station right at 2 o'clock, right as they're about to go on air. And it seems like he leaves right after. So he works roughly three hours a day. I know a lot of radio personalities who, if they have a 2 to 5 show, they're in at 10 a.m. and they're prepping and they're doing paperwork, getting everything ready, you know, going over the ratings, going over the, the um, emails and meetings that they have about the show. It seems like Frazier doesn't do any of that. So I can't imagine how highly he's paid. But it seems like he should be doing private practice. He, he, could, he could do, he, you know, he could see his own clients, his own patients from 10 a.m. to 1, and then he could do another shift at night if he wanted to. But it's just strange to me that he's so rich and he's so affluent. He lives this absolute high society life on that type of a salary. Um, I think it would have made more sense if he was like a published author, if he had published a book and he was getting royalties from that, uh, which helped fuel his fame on the radio. But it makes sense that Niles lives this lifestyle because he has Maris's money. And later on, we see what happens to him when he's deprived of that the Shangri-La, but we're getting seasons ahead of ourselves. So Frazier's at a KACL, and we have the very first appearance of Bob Bulldog Briscoe and the Gonzo Sports Show. Uh, Frazier was going to read his book in the studio, but apparently because they lost transmitter power in Studio C, transmitter link power in Studio C was the exact excuse, uh, 
Bulldog has to do a show in Frazier's studio, and apparently they never got it back because Bulldog will always be right in waiting for Frazier to finish up, and he wheels in his cart with the gong and the horns and everything like that. And Bulldog is a great character who's underutilized in future seasons, but we'll talk more about him later when we have a Bulldog-centric episode, which isn't too far off. Ross is talking about sex with her mom on the phone, and um, Frazier later mentions his mother, and, and they, Niles and Frazier are talking about how they're both so refined and their mother was so refined, and they think dad was dropped off at a basket, in a basket at their doorstep. So Roth invites Frazier across the street for one of those fancy coffee drinks. Now, this is supposed to be late 93, and Starbucks opened in 1971. And by 93, they were poised to explode. They were going to begin opening, I think, at the, at the high point, uh, two stores a day. So it's strange that Roz is talking about these new fancy coffee drinks. It was already a Seattle institution by this point that I think everyone would have at least known about. But maybe they assume that we, the audience, don't know, because in 93, across the country, people weren't drinking $4 lattes yet. At the house, Fraser asks for his finely ground Kenya blend from Starbucks, one of the only times that Starbucks is actually mentioned on the show. And later at Cafe Nervosa, Niles asks for a caffè latte per piacere. So Fraser tries to read his book under a tree. Really, Fraser? He gets forced back home due to rain, and the apartment is suspiciously empty. So he goes and gets his book, pours himself a glass of wine, sets himself up with pillows on the couch, sits down, and he's just about to begin reading and the door open, and here comes his father, Mary Poppins, and the hound from hell barging in, intrusion. And believe me, I feel that pain. I live in a house, we, we have a large family, as you may know, I have three little kids, and sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll get home, I'll be the first one home from work, and I'll say I have the whole house to myself, and I'll pour myself a cold drink, and I'll sit down, I'll flip the TV on, and everyone comes in, and of course I'm glad to see everyone, but I do know what that's like, to hear the key go in the lock, and you kind of go, Ugh. <laughs> So I, I, I do feel Fraser's pain on this one. And Fraser and Martin fight again, and Martin calls Fraser a fussy hothouse orchid and says he should live in a bubble. So Fraser retreats to Cafe Nervosa, where he meets Niles, and Fraser says, Oh, what fresh hell is this? One of my favorite lines. I use that in my in my day to day life. A uh, little fun fact, he's trying to read The Holotropic Mind by Stanislav Grof. Interesting book about the psyche. Niles advises Fraser to, to try a bit harder with Dad, and they do have a good chat. And in these early episodes, Fraser and Niles, they are having their coffee, but Niles isn't the breakout character he would become. He's so far just Fraser's sounding board. And he hasn't met Daphne yet either. That's coming up, I think, next week. It's coming up very soon. So when Fraser comes back up, Daphne's moving all his stuff out to the study. She's packing up his things and the furniture, and she's going to take it down to the storeroom. So they get on an egg timer, and Frazier has Martin agree to sit down at the table with him and talk, have a real talk for one minute, and to share something about each other that the other one doesn't know, a real personal issue or secret. And Martin immediately replies, this is stupid. And Frazier says, one second, that's our personal best. Let's see if we can beat that, shall we? And it's a really great scene between the two of them, and they agree. Martin says, how about the Seahawks? And Frazier says, no sports. And Martin says, then no opera, and they agree. So Frazier proceeds to tell Martin about the time that, when he was really having a tough time with Lilith, that he climbed out onto a balcony, onto a ledge, and he thought about ending it all once and for all. And he remembered Frederick. And Martin says, and you didn't jump, huh? And Frazier makes a great comment about him being a detective. And this actually was a great episode of Cheers. I think it was in the eighth season. It was called The Girl in the Plastic Bubble. And it's a great Frasier Lilith episode. And it actually shows this event, so I recommend you check that episode out. So Martin shares with Frasier that he can turn his eyelid inside out like kids do at camp. And Frasier says, this is your gut-wrenching, painful experience. And Martin says, it hurt. And it really speaks to both of their characters, that Frasier is always looking to find this, this, this epiphany, looking inside himself, inside his psyche, to find some new truth. And Martin just wants to have a very surface-level explanation and understanding of things, and he doesn't want to talk about feelings. That's his generation, but more importantly, it's his character. So the egg timer saves them um, by ringing just as they're screaming insults at each other. And just, just like we talked about last week, the fight actually gets a little bit dirty. It gets a little nasty between the two of them. And the egg timer really does save them because it was about to get, they're about to start saying things that they couldn't take back. 
and it's not played for laughs. So Frazier basically says he thinks it's best if Martin leaves. He's ready to, and it's just the second episode of the first season, he's ready to throw Martin out. And Martin says, hey, you wanted to form some connection with me. That thing it takes a couple of years. You can't do it in a day, so let's give it some more time. And he basically says he's not going anywhere. So it's Martin who wants to try to forge this relationship with Frazier, but he's not going to say it in so many words, but he thinks it's worth putting the time in, which really speaks to his character as well. And it shows the hope for the future that these two gentlemen have. Martin is absolutely willing to try, and as a psychiatrist, Frazier should know that. One of the central tenets of the show is that Frazier has all the answers for everyone except himself. So in the end, Martin, of course, tricks Frazier into making a beer run, and that's another good scene. And on the stinger, uh, Frazier, he's reading in the storeroom. He's sitting in a chair in the storeroom, one of the chairs I think that he would, he would love to have out, but either Daphne threw it out of her bedroom, out of Frazier's study where he does his most profound thinking, or it was the one, um, one of the ones that was in Martin's room. So he's sitting there, he's reading, and at the end he finally found the peace and quiet that he'd been looking for. So my notes this week. Daphne takes a look at her watch when Frazier is having a glass of wine and she kind of makes a face, but if Frazier's show runs from 2 to 5, then it's got to be about 6 o'clock by now, so why is she making a face? Is he, you know, and also, for that matter, and it's kind of a central question for the whole show, how is he so rich and, and, and affluent uh, working part-time at an AM radio station? I think we'll, we'll get into that more in future episodes that focus more on Frazier's lifestyle. Um, at KACL, we have some real variety. I mean, there's the Auto Lady, there's uh, the, the Gonzo Sports Show with Bulldog, there's a psychiatrist, there's a restaurant review show. It's, it's some real variety radio there on AM. I don't know anything like it uh, in my area, but I feel like it's unfortunately a lost medium having a radio sh uh, station with such a format like that. They mentioned Frazier's mother. I don't remember if they mentioned her in the pilot, but uh, she'll be mentioned often on her name's Hester, and she unfortunately passed away, and she will become actually a larger character as the show moves forward. She did actually appear on Cheers, uh, but albeit played by a different actress. Uh, Martin's voice is actually pretty gravelly. Uh, it does soften as the show goes on, but he's, he's, still, he's still very gruff. They actually had a, a little title on the stinger, One Man's Storage Room is Another Man's Sanctuary. I don't think we see very many titles on the stingers moving forward. I will keep an eye open to see if that actually happens again. Uh, but it's strange. It's strange to have the title followed up immediately by the credits. Uh, finally, Niles ordering an Italian. I don't know that he does that often. I know later on he'll say, like, macchiato. But uh, this week's coffee order, which we already went over, was a little bit of an anomaly as well. So next week, it's dinner at 8. And as always, thank you very much for watching. It is the magic that is me. <laughs> Get used to it. I know this is a stressful time, and this is new for all of us, but I'm sure that soon we'll all be getting along swimmingly. Oh, six more weeks of winter, I see. Oh, dear God. <laughs>